And so I, actually, I think I saw something he posted a, a, a small house or cabin or something. Yep. Is that what it was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's yeah. a place called Quinell Forks. And it's in. So the, was it re- remote? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Very okay. remote. It's it's actually really, really cool. And nice. uh, the drive there, I mean, considering that uh, the, the road is only about 15 feet wide and the drive there is, like, intense. It's good. Here we go, Dave. Here's the intro. Hi, hi, hi. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free for you at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. David Weatherly is a renaissance man of the strange and supernatural. He has literally traveled around the world searching for ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, magic, and everything strange in between. Yes, this is a man who became fascinated with the paranormal at a young age, and now he's globetrotting, trying to find the unknown. Ghost stories and accounts of weird creatures and UFOs led him to discover many early influences, like Jacques Vallée and John Keel along with Hans Holder and others, as he is now spending his life exploring and investigating the unexplained. David also has a plethora of books out there, which can be found at eerielights.com. He'll be happy to know I finally got his website right, right off the top of the bat. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paradoia Magazine. Mr. David Weatherly, I know this is your favorite time of the year, Halloween time. How have you been doing? Oh, it's the best time of the year, definitely. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm working on lots of projects, and it's a very different year, you know, with no events or uh, anything major really going on in that sense. So uh, a very different shift in focus, but, you know, we all make the best of it. Are you happy I got your website right for the first time? You didn't have to correct me. Fantastic. (laughs) What a great job. I know. I know. (laughs) You have no idea how I stress out about that. Totally stress out about that, <laughs> but that's the way it is. That's the way it is. David, you finally for, write. You finally write it down in front of me. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> I got a. I got a big glowing eerielights.com sign underneath my my screens here. You know, Dave. I I, I want to start this off on a on a on an angry note. And why I'm angry is because I set up this uh, new gifting site for Sasquatch because we started having some action around here and I've kind of let you in on a little bit of that near uh, the crash site and started getting a little bit of action we put up a trail cam had it up there for seven days the only pictures taken on that trail cam was us setting them up and then us arriving to take them down it's it hurt my feelings Dave hurt my feelings <laughs> and and was anything uh, nothing was disturbed during that time Either. Nothing, nothing. Nothing you left it, out? It was absolutely silent there, and I didn't expect what that. What kind of area is this in? Is it remote? Yes. There's one road in, one road out. Um, now, that's not saying that anybody who, because it's hunting season up here, and there's hunters all over the place, but it's not saying that, that they haven't been in the area, because you could tell, we could tell that we were fresh in there because all of the puddles had ice on them, you know, and that's always one of the little telltale signs of whether or not the road is being, 
uh, worked during uh, this time of year is if, you know, as it gets colder, the puddles start to gather ice. Well, we broke the ice coming in. So we knew nobody had been there for at least a few days. Now, did you catch her? Did you capture any other wildlife on camera? Nothing. Not a deer, not a rabbit, not a bird, nothing. Now, see, that, that in itself is very unusual, though. In that area, yes. Because every other yeah. time that we were there, we had things moved. Whether it was the ball or the nickel disappearing and then a different nickel reappearing, whether it was sticks that we placed around the area, everything just seemed to be moving in that area. And now we put the trail cam up, nothing. It was like they all knew. They all knew. Something told them. I'm blaming the chipmunks. That's what I'm blaming. <laughs> well, it, it's very strange, but at the same time, you know, we have to to look at it in terms of continuing to collect a full body of evidence. And when you look at something like that, that's that's an unusual period of time to have absolutely no activity from any kind of wildlife. Now, there are a lot of Sasquatch sightings where people report that before seeing the creature, everything goes silent. You know, no, no birds, no other animals. Um, there's accounts where people will see, you know, the deer run by because they're running from something and then everything goes quiet. So, you know, lots of considerations. I mean, I would encourage you to just keep working the location oh, and definitely. keep trying, keep trying different experiments. You know, I mean, we can, we can talk about that some, you know, off air, but lots of different things you can try. Well, you know, the, the issue with our area, and I don't know if it is in other areas as well, but around here, trail cams seem to be a very interesting uh, piece of equipment that some not-so-good people will go out and steal. So a lot of people actually in our area have, uh, have stopped actually putting trail cams out outside of the government ones that are out there, tracking animals, tracking hunters and license plates, etc., and you can tell the difference because the government's not trying to hide theirs. Other people are. So, I mean, it's just one of those things where I think people aren't putting enough trail cams out here. And the fact that, like, with my buddy Mike, a different Mike than you know, uh, he had his out there for a week. And he was, after about four or five days, he was getting a little nervous out there because he's like, I don't want my trail cam stolen. I've already had that happen. So it was just one of those weird things. Yeah, sadly, that's a, a common occurrence in a lot of locations. You know, unless you, unless you've got private property or something that's very remote that you know people just aren't coming to, then you know there's not a whole lot of solutions to it. There really aren't. Uh, now, I have known people that have, you know, built very elaborate uh, <laughs> things for their trail cams so that they can put them out in order to to try to prevent people from taking them. But um, you know, if somebody's determined enough, they're going to snatch it one way or the other. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the good part about it is is uh, when when we are out there and we are, uh, you know, the area where we have this set up, yes, a lot of people will go into that area. Not many. When I say a lot, like I'm, I'm saying maybe a dozen, two dozen people a year will go into that location. But they're going there for the crash site. They're not going there to take the detour that we did to find a Bigfoot gifting site. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Sure. So that's, sure. I mean, that's, that's, they're going there for the history or whatever of the, of the location, but you know, you still, you just have to be careful and, and, you know, you either take the chance and leave the cameras out or, you know, you get nothing, right? <laughs> no, absolutely. But do you think, do you think that like that area, Dave, it, it just went so silent and, you know, the trails that we have it on, the trails are nice and wide and everything. You know, it's meant, you can tell it's a it's like a super highway for the animals. But the fact that not a single photo of a single animal over a week there, and we had it on night vision and daytime vision. That's just odd. Yeah, that's that's very bizarre. It, it really is. 
And, you know, you're talking about, I mean, I know we've talked some about this location before, and there's other types of activity that go on there, apparently. So, you know, it's, uh, th- this is one of those typical situations when you're really trying to examine a location or a particular case or something where the more you dig in and, and the more you try to get answers, the more questions you end up with. So, you know, here you have this curious situation where you've gone for a full week and, and there's just nothing at all. Um, so, you know, this is why I noted might be time to try some other different things there and to see, see what kind of results you can get. Well, we're going to keep pushing it. Uh, I think with the other gifting site that we have, we're not getting much action there at all. Probably once I, I might go back out there one more time and just pull it because it just doesn't seem to have anything going on. And that would be like three years of nothing going on. So I'm going to move it all. Got to find a location. Do you have any recent recent sightings in that area? No. 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 Nothing. Mm -hmm. But the the intrigue is around the new site. And I just hope that uh, putting the camera up there didn't scare anything off. No, I don't think so. No, just keep working at it. I'm going to take your advice on that one. I'm going to take your advice on that one for sure. David Weatherly is our guest tonight on Space Out Radio. In my opinion, he is one of the best investigators in the world. Never mind the United States where he lives or North America, but the world when it comes to putting all of these puzzle pieces together. David, if you were to look at a puzzle, all right, and you're putting this paranormal puzzle together, how finished are you? Oh, my gosh. Have you got the outline? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I would say I have the outline. I'd, I'd say maybe I have the centerpiece. You know, because we really don't know what the parameters of this are. You know, especially if we look at it all holistically and look at the varied types of phenomena and everything else, some of which are you know, seem to be related and other portions that don't seem to be related. But, you know, it's one of those things that every, you know, every certain amount of time, new pieces of the puzzle come in and it kind of, it shuffles the entire board, so to speak. So looking at it using that analogy, I would say, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe the center portion, maybe an idea, a loose idea of, what kind of a picture is developing, but uh, that too changes. You know, this is as many years as I've been doing this, uh, I still, I have more questions all the time. What's the leading questions that you have? I mean, you are so much more involved than anybody that I know regarding this field. What What's pushing you? What What are those questions? I think that... You know, for me, it probably comes down more to, uh, well, curiosity, certainly, and the desire to get to the bottom of some of these things, you know, to kind of really, really see something realized, I guess, is is how I would phrase it. I, I know a lot of people get into this because they're interested in convincing other people, you know, and... I, I'm not somebody who I, I don't need convinced because I've had enough experiences, uh, but I'm at the point where I really want to understand more about how all of this phenomena relates to each other, if it does at all, and you know how it relates to our human interaction with what's going on. Because you know something I'm a big advocate of is it's it's important to understand any given case it's important to understand and listen to the witnesses and the people who have had the experience but it's equally important to understand how the individuals having the experience have influenced the overall situation so you know um, someone witnessing a, a ufo for instance you know what is the dynamic that unfolds with their experience of seeing it and how they've reacted during the encounter itself. And, you know, these are questions that really can kind of send us down the rabbit hole because we have to start to understand 
is this, you know, there's a lot of different theories that have been presented over the years. You know, some people think, oh, you know, all these strange things that happen, they're all hallucinations, or they're all, you know, people are just imagining them, or uh, there's, you know, there's something else going on. And then you have other theories that come along on occasion that and say, oh, they're all tulpas, you know, the things that are being created, but only momentarily. Uh, you get the window theory, you know, people are seeing through, you know, a window in time, or they're getting a glimpse of something, or maybe it's just psychic information. So you get all these different theories that come and go over the years. Uh, but, you know, to me, that's also a constant theme of saying, what is the, what's happening with the person who's experiencing the phenomena? You know, what's the interaction creating? Um, because we have a lot of similarities in encounters, but we have a lot of variations too. And, you know, how does the individual person dictate the experience? Uh, so, you know, that kind of gets into to bigger questions where we could take the route and say, okay, well, maybe these things are pulpits that we're co-creating, you know, a, a created uh, experience or, you know, maybe there's something else going on. There's all these theories in the last few years about uh, the potential that we're all living in a matrix. And it's kind of intriguing to think about, well, you know, if that's the case, are some of these experiences just glitches in the programming, so to speak? Uh, but at the same time, you can take that idea and, and think, all right, well, that's intriguing, but to some degree, it probably simplifies it. You know, what's the What's the grander picture? You know, what's the what's the greater um, reality to what's going on? Those are the kind of things that really drive me. And I don't blame you. I, I think we all need to have that drive and the desire. You, you've just been able to do it on such a different level that I, I commend you for that. Hey, I got a question, a little bit off topic here for you, but still it down the same road. One of the most controversial figures against anything paranormal or supernatural has always been James Randi. He just recently passed away, and I'm curious what your thoughts are with that because he really tried to push the limits on trying to call out a lot of the shysters and BSers in the paranormal world. What's your opinion of this? Uh, I met James Randi, and, um, you know, wasn't impressed. (laughs) Um, I think that this might get a few people pissed off at me, but um, the long and short is, is that, you know, Randy, if you know much about him and you look at his career, he was a magician for a while who was really just trying to imitate Harry Houdini's act. Uh, you see early James Randy posters, you know, he was, he was doing all of Houdini's escapes. He was, he was completely modeled in himself after Houdini, nothing original about that. You know, it's just imitating you know, someone who was arguably one of the greatest magicians of all time. And, you know, I think that what happened with Randy was that uh, he, he went that course and didn't get the success or the level of attention that he wanted. And uh, lo and behold, along comes Eric Geller. And, uh, you, you know, Randy's course took a, a different direction because suddenly he, it, his whole identity really uh, was in uh, arguing with Uri Geller, you know, <laughs> by saying, "Oh, it's you know, it's all trickery, and I, I'm I'm going to prove it." And uh, you know, he he was very successful at becoming um, the center of attention for a while, just by being a counterpoint to the things that Uri Geller was doing. Um, and I, I guess he found the success he was looking for. To a degree, and you know, through the course of that, became this, of course, role model for a lot of, uh, you know, for the skeptic organization and, and so forth. But you know, there's a lot of a lot of things you could say about him, and you know, of course, a lot of a lot of people took issue with the fact that as much as he advocated, you know, being honest and open, and and you know, revealing the secrets and all this kind of thing, he was also um, living a secret life that was only revealed, you know, in, in the later years of his life. Um, so, you know, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't 
bode very well, I don't think, for his his level of, of honesty with what he was trying to do. What was his secret life? I, I don't know about that. Oh, he he was um well, we won't go into that on the air. If you haven't read about that, I'll just I'll just leave it. It's a, it's right. maybe a little bit controversial, but I'm sure I'm sure some people know what I'm talking about and uh goes a completely different route. The the long and short was that he just you know, he chose to hide certain things about his life and that's you know, that's his decision. But at the same time, if you're doing that and you're trying to advocate that, you know, you're you're revealing everything and, and you know, Right. You're not going to lie about anything. It's it's kind of a contradiction. All right. Well, you know, I think for a lot of people, they would have liked to have got his million dollars. But I mean, any type of skeptic, yeah, as deeply well. skeptical <laughs> as, as deeply skeptical as him, you're never going to prove it anyways. I mean, you could have walk an alien on the no. stage, and he's not going to believe you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And the and the way that challenge was written, uh, it was you know would have been very possible for anybody to win that anyway. Well, he got a television show out of it. I guess he lucked out. He got paid. He got paid. He got paid. Yeah, he got, exactly. In the end, he got paid. He got, he got publicity and he got paid. So, you know, I think that's what he was looking for to begin with. Dave, we got a couple minutes before we go to break at the bottom of the hour here. And... I know Halloween is your favorite time of the month and the time of the year and everything along those lines. Why is it so special to you? Well, you know, if you look at the origins of Halloween and uh, the traditions that surround it, it, you find some intriguing information because one of the key things is that it is the time of the year where the veil is the thinnest. And that means that the veil between this world and the spirit world are the thinnest during this time. Now, for the Celts, the ancient Celts, this was, you know, New Year's. This was a holiday called Samhain. And there were a lot of different traditions associated uh, with the holiday in old Europe that eventually kind of trickled down into, you know, modern Halloween. But some of the more old mystical aspects many people have forgotten. And... You know, this, this whole idea of the veil being thin is one of those things. Uh, so it was believed to be a time of the year that it was uh, the easiest for us to communicate with the spirit world, for us to reach through the veil or for them to, to come through and interact with us. And I think that alone makes it pretty pretty fascinating. And then, of course, you know, you've got all the other various aspects. I mean, the the entire modern celebration of Halloween, I think, is just a really good time. And, you know, the fall is a great season with all the changes in colors and everything else. So it's just a great combination. Well, you know, it, it's one of those things, too. What, what's David Weatherly's fa- favorite, th- 40 seconds here, favorite costume? What do you like to dress up as? Oh, I change it around all the time, so I don't, I don't know that I have a favorite. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't know about that. How many times have you done Elvis? Never done Elvis. You'd make a good Elvis. No. You would. Never done that. <laughs> Just saying. No. You know. <laughs> <laughs> David Weatherly is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. As we are going to hop out and head to a break here, we'll find out what this Halloween lover likes when it comes to spooky stories. As it is Halloween time, once again, David's website, and I highly suggest you check it out because you can find all of his books there, is EerieLights.com. Yeah, EerieLights.com. He's one of the best. He's one of the top researchers in the world when it comes to everything paranormal, and he's right here for you on Spaced Out Radio. More with David Weatherly next on the Mighty SOR. All right, we're clear, man. All right. There's a lot of talk about the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I've never seen it. No, really? Never seen it. talking about that? I don't know. Just, to, just because they're going to see it? <laughs> they are just, <laughs> I guess it's it's tradition for some people. I've never seen it. I'm probably getting shit for that because I've, 
They uh, they already bug me that I've ne- <laughs> that I've never seen X Files or Star Trek or Supernatural. Oh my gosh, you've never seen. Oh my gosh, no. And and here you know you you've never seen X Files and you've never seen Supernatural. Nope. nope. Oh, I, I refuse to watch Supernatural because because uh, I couldn't stand that one guy on the Gilmore Girls. Couldn't stand him. I know. All right. So you, you're admitting that you've never seen Supernatural, but you watched the Gilmore Girls. You know, this is not doing much for you. Anyway. I know. I know. I also like Nickelback. <laughs> okay. I'll give it up. I like Nickelback, too. Okay. I watched the entire series of Gilmore Girls, and I like Nickelback. There you go. There you go. I'm out. I'm James Randying myself right now. I'm out. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But, ah, well, I know. I know. Just another, put another X beside Dave right there. No, Gilmore Girls over <laughs> Supernatural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I did watch it for Sebastian Bach. You're right. Not that second part, Martha. <laughs> oh, man. I said, well, what's your excuse for x Files? You don't have one. I don't have one. Um, Terrible. You know what? I think the reason why when it first came out in the early, was it the early 90s it came out? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I think the reason why I didn't watch it was because I coached hockey on those nights. And so I never got to never got to watch it. I was yeah, too. See, you, got no, you got no excuse now because you know the everybody's been on lockdown for months. So <laughs> you know, uh, plenty of places you could watch it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I believe that. I believe that. Just if I could find the time now to watch it. <laughs> I'm a busy guy. I'm a very busy guy. Oh, I hear you. I took I, I took the last two days off work uh, to hang out with Merle when he was up here, and liter- yeah. and literally this afternoon after Merle left, I wandered into work because I didn't know what I I should do with my time, and I got kicked out of my own work by my boss. He says, "Hey, it's your day off, jerk. Get out of here. We got this." Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's my life getting. Um, Kicked out of work because I showed up on a day off. <laughs> He's like, don't worry, we got you really busy for tomorrow. Thanks, boss. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. What do we do? What do we do? We got just under two minutes here. Just under two minutes. And here it comes. Derek on Twitter. I like Nickelback, Dave. You know we can hear you with a, a gif of somebody shaking their head. <laughs> and Anthony, by the way, on Twitter, hashtag Gilmore Girls Forever, brother. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. All right. I'm getting some love. I'm getting some support. Oh. Hey, thank you for the super chat, Zoe Buttercup. With the cutest smile. You know, remember uh, Three Amigos? My little buddy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So she comes in, Zoe Buttercup. So Zoe Buttercup with the cutest smile. Anyways, that's Three Amigos, man. That's my humor. You're, you're, you're wanting to hang up now, aren't you, Dave? <laughs> you're getting close. No, I'm just, I'm just ignoring you. Uh, no, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> let's see. For later, Dave, look up Billy Jealousy Lunatic Fridge. Pomade? It's number one. Oh, pomade. It's number one. Hair is looking fresh, by the way. Thank you. I worked hard on it today. Worked very hard. You have to get the right amount of hair gel to hold it. And I won today. I won. 
All right, here we go, everyone. Five seconds before we get going. Thank you, Zoe, for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Thank you, everybody, tuning in. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I'm Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight, we continue on with David Weatherly. He comes in every couple of months to hang out and talk everything strange and weird that is going on in this world. His website, where you can find all of his books, is eerielights.com. David, how many books have you actually published now for yourself? Uh, That are in print, uh, probably, uh, gosh, I don't even know. I think it's 20-something. My goodness, you're, you're pumping out what? somewhere around there. I, Two, three a year. I always, I always have, I always have a couple of manuscripts that are, you know, already done and and just aren't published yet. So it gets kind of hard to keep track. So, uh, no, more than that, I, I put out several last year, and this year so far has been, uh, let's see, Monsters of Alaska, Woodknots for uh, Haunted Churches that Ross and I did, and uh, Monsters at the Crossroads, the Indiana book. And there was something else. I can't even remember what the other one was. There was, there was another one, too. And then there's there's probably going to be another one before the end of the year. Yeah. Oh, and then Shadow Chaser. I just uh, put that out. That's the one. I so co-wrote that with uh, another fellow. I don't know where you find the time. I really don't. <laughs> i got to ask you. All right. You're, you're a guy who likes spooky stories. You collect a lot of them. You write a lot about them. What's scarier for you, dealing with monsters and cryptids or dealing with ghosts? Uh, neither one of them, really. You know, I, I'm I'm just fascinated by it, so you know, I don't have that kind of reaction to it. Okay. So I mean I think I think we've talked about this, you know, before on, on air because, you know, really I, I think that what's more frightening is what living people do oh, <laughs> true know, to other people. Yes. So uh, you know, that's that's the thing that I'm always more cautious about when I when I go on locations to investigate, especially with you know, some of the areas that you you know, and they both have dangers, you know, because a lot of haunted places they're in you know, sometimes not great parts of the city or they're, you know, they're in, in um, you know, they're, they're run down and abandoned. But then, you know, you've got cryptic cases. A lot of times these sightings take place, you know, you have to worry about wildlife dangers. But then, of course, you have, you know, crazy things like <clears throat> these days it's, you know, illegal pot farms and, you know, stuff like that, drug dealers, people cooking meth and, garbage life out out in these wild areas that you know under most conditions uh several years ago it would have been fine to go out you know tromping around but now you have to be worried about it incredible incredible okay so you you did the book on alaska alaska is a weird Mm -hmm. place all around you have the alaskan triangle there's there's the stories about alien abduction up there you have you know, Japanese Airlines, 1680, back in 1988, coming uh, into contact with that mile-long UFO. There's a lot of weird things happening Mm -hmm. in Alaska. What makes Alaska so strange? Well, I think it's a combination of several things. You know, first of all, you have to understand what a large state we're talking about. You know, most people don't... um, uh, really have a clear picture of how big Alaska is. You know, we're, we're talking about a vast amount of territory, uh, much of which is, is very remote. And the population, 
you know, is is sparse, except on except in the cities, and you know, even even the main cities, they don't reach that high of a population. So, I think you have a lot of unique things that come in. You have incredibly rich native traditions. You have, uh, you know, which gives a, a very old body of folklore and traditional tales and so forth. Uh, but a lot of those stories can kind of translate into modern monster tales. And, you know, these things are still occurring. So you have that. You have uh, the the fact that there have been various, uh, you know, conspiracy type of theories that have been centered around Alaska because of the remoteness. You know, there's been uh, different installations built up there. For instance, Harp, you know, which uh, officially closed down, but uh, that's a, a long-standing uh, conspiracy, you know, center point that it was weather manipulation and everything else. So you get all these crazy stories involving that, and then you get things like you're talking about with the Alaska Triangle, you know, there's an incredibly high number of disappearances in Alaska. And while on the one hand, we could probably explain some of those because of the environment, because of, uh, you know, wild animals and other different things, it, it also kind of leaves us with a big question because there are so many disappearances. So I don't know. I think it just comes in from many different directions. We get the, the strange factor seems to, really be on all sides in Alaska and it, it's a fascinating place. It really is very intriguing and it has this kind of raw energy when you're there that, you know, you, you feel like you're in a, a uniquely different place. It's, it's otherworldly to a degree. Okay. So for a lot of the strange sightings, you mentioned that, you know, some of these things that are happening, you could tell they're not being done by animals. I mean, this is one thing I know from living in central BC, but the minute you go into northern British Columbia, the Yukon, Alaska, Northwest Territories, once you hit about, you know, two thirds of the way up, the animals just get larger. And, you know, like a moose where I am is probably twelve hundred to fifteen hundred pounds. And that's a that's maxed sure. out. You go up to that Alaska area, you're looking at a moose that's probably anywhere from two thousand to three thousand pounds. You know, 3,000 yeah. may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but they're much larger. You go into, you know, bears, uh, grizzly bears, Kodiak bears. There's a bunch of large bear breeds, including polar bears, which seem to wander into that area. We're dealing with a, a lot larger creatures the more northern we go. And so I'm wondering, how can we tell if it's something that is supernatural, like a Bigfoot or a Dogman that is causing this, comparatively to, say, a 2,000-pound Kodiak bear? Well, and we can't, really, because uh, unless a scene is found that has clear evidence, uh, for instance, of you know a bear being involved or something, then a lot of the times we really don't know. And many of these people that go missing, there's just no evidence at all. You know, they've just vanished. And you bring up a good point about the size of the animals because, you know, while they are there and people do spot them around the different little, you know, uh, small towns and so forth, it also begs the question, what else is living there that is intentionally staying out of the spotlight? And I think this is one of the reasons that, you know, there are so many Sasquatch sightings in Alaska. I mean, it's crazy. When I, when I wrote the Alaska book, uh, there's of course a big, um, section in there on, you know, the various hairy man legends and, and modern Sasquatch sightings and everything. But I mean, really that's kind of the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it would take volumes if you tried to chronicle every single sighting just that we're aware of, just that someone has reported. And the reality is when you go up there and you start talking to people, there are so many accounts, you know, that people who, who don't want to go on record or who don't, you know, they'll tell you about the encounter, but they don't want their name used or, you know, the information. And, and you know, sometimes this is a matter of, uh, well, if it's a, a Native person, they maybe don't want any attention on their community. Uh, if it's if it's someone else, for instance, in law enforcement or something, well, they don't want their names used or, or you know, attention put on it. But uh, this is this is something that 
you start spending time out there, you'll find that a lot of people are aware of these various uh, legends of these creatures, and many of them have stories to share with you. What's the weirdest or freakiest story you ever heard come out of the state of Alaska? Well, the the Port Chatham story is pretty weird, and uh, you know that's that's a small community that um, was set up as a uh, fish processing, and it never grew very large. Uh, it did have a post office for a time in oh, like the 1940s, if I recall correctly, and um, you know this this little village which is about all it was uh was suddenly abandoned and all the people that lived there just up and left and they all moved to you know a, a neighboring town which is pretty far and as the story began to come out uh it was that they had left their village because of a Sasquatch. Now, they weren't calling it that. They were talking about a hairy man, and they were using native terms. But uh, the story was that uh, this creature or creatures, whichever, uh, living on the outside of this town in the mountains surrounding it were violent. And there had been a series of strange deaths that unfolded in this town. The first was a gentleman who was, was up in the hills, and he was cutting, uh, he was logging. And when they found him, he had been killed with a blow to the head. But they determined that he had been struck with this piece of logging machinery that no human could have picked up. So it was, it was a very bizarre case. But then the other stories got even stranger because they started saying that uh, hunters would go up and uh, into the hills and never come back. But that later... Uh, not to be too gruesome, but that pieces of them would wash down into the, you know, to the water around town where something had torn them apart and it didn't appear to be a grizzly bear. Uh, you know, there were tales of hunters tracing or tracking animals and suddenly there was a second set of tracks and clear signs of a struggle and the animal was, uh, you know, no more tracks. Uh, but there were humanoid tracks going off oh. in a different direction. So, you know, lots of these stories that unfolded. And, and uh, there was a native elder who much later told the story uh, to a reporter that she remembered being a child and growing up in the town and that they just were suddenly told that they had to leave because of the hairy man and that they were told to, you know, you're taking whatever you can, and, and we're leaving here. And the entire town just left. So, you know, that's that's a pretty incredible story uh, for, you know, entire community. Granted, there weren't a whole lot of people there, but still an entire community that just decides, uh, no, this creature is is too dangerous and we can't stay here anymore. So they left. And, and incidentally, it's fascinating because I tried to get there. Uh, the town, you know, the abandoned town is still there. It's it's rather remote. It's difficult to get to. And, uh, you know, I, I I tried to get uh, to the town a couple of different occasions when I was in Alaska, but it just the conditions weren't right and so forth. But uh, I have talked to two different people who have been to the town, and they both report that it is a very bizarre place. When you're there, uh, you know, you have this sense of being watched. Uh, it, it's it's kind of an unsettling location apparently uh there's a, a gentleman who he runs an alaska bigfoot uh organization uh, just collects accounts and so forth and you know i did his show when the alaska book came out and he was telling me i think we were talking about it mostly off air but he was telling me about being uh, in the town and just how weird it was and you know they had some some strange things happen when they were there so it it's one of these mysteries that uh, you know here we have people who are still living who are saying no we left because of a hairy man and of course you know who in the mainstream is going to accept that you know, oh you know it's a folktale or whatever she doesn't remember it correctly well no i 
I bet you that she does. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, it's clear that there was something very strange that unfolded in that little community. Dave, besides that, are they getting Dogman stories? Are they getting Yeti stories up there as well? Maybe Wendigos? Because once you cross the border into the Yukon and go through the Northwest Territories, through the prairies, and start to head east, there's a lot more indigenous culture that talks about the Wendigo up north as well. Yeah, I've never heard a, a Wendigo story from Alaska, not that I recall. Uh, dog man, you know, a couple of stories here and there, but it mostly, it mostly is variations of Sasquatch stories uh, that you hear. And of course the Krishnaka, uh, which is a shapeshifter, but the, the Bigfoot sightings, you know, they don't, um, they don't really refer to, there's lots of different native names for Bigfoot because there's so many different tribes in Alaska. They all have their own name for the creatures and, uh, they still they they always pretty much roughly translate to you know hairy man or hairy giant or uh, there's one that translates has a little um, big man with a pointed hat uh, is is roughly how it comes out and that that was kind of curious because you know you see all these reports and um, depictions of Sasquatch with of course the sagittal crest on on his head. And, you know, from some people's perspectives, uh, that might look like a, a strange little pointed hat or something on the, on the figure's head. So I think that's where that came from. But, yeah, mostly, you know, mostly Sasquatch-oriented reports up there. Does the Sasquatch reports up there seem to be a lot more malevolent and violent comparatively to the West Coast where – the creature seems to want nothing to do with people and, and is quite elusive. Well, not always, uh, but you have to remember too, that, you know, we're talking about Alaska, which is still in some regards, a bit of a frontier and, you know, the state nickname is the last frontier. And that translates to many of the people that live there when they live in remote areas, uh, certainly. So you do get more accounts in in the state of people you know, taking a shot at these creatures when they see them. You know, there's there's a story from around Lake Iliamna of a gentleman who you know he was driving in his truck and saw one of these creatures coming across the road, and his his first reaction was to reach into the glove box and grab his pistol and. <laughs> jump out and take a couple of shots at it. You know, I mean, he didn't know what this thing was. So, you know, there's kind of that cowboy attitude that you get with some of these, uh, some of these people living in remote areas up there. And because of that, maybe, maybe you do get an edge of, you know, more aggressive encounters from time to time. But then conversely, you know, has, with many other places in North America, most of the native peoples will say, you know, just leave them alone. You know, we just, we live in peace with them and that's the way it needs to be. So uh, they don't mess with them and, and the hairy creatures don't mess with them either. David, the way I look at with Alaska, I mean, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of nomads out there and vagabonds that live on their own. They, they become almost forest people themselves, you know, trying to get away from society. And I know Alaska, in my own research of it, has a lot of people who, who may be done with the lower 48 states because they can't handle the populations or they can't handle the politics or whatever, so they look to just disappear. How do we know it's not these people who have been out of society for a number of years that have maybe gone crazy living in the wilderness? <laughs> You know, a few of those stories came up when I was doing research, and I, I think that you just have to look closely at the account and listen to the what to what the witness is saying. You know, there there are a few stories here and there uh, that certainly sound like something you know akin to a a wild man or someone who's you know gone completely native, so to speak. But there's way too many of these accounts that 
give clear descriptions of these creatures, you know, and we're talking about uh, creatures that are often, you know, seven foot or more in height. I mean, that's not a, you know, that's not a guy who moved from Boise to get away from it all. You know, that's something else that's existing up there. So, interestingly enough, a lot of the really fascinating accounts come from people who do do live out in the wilds in Alaska. You know, they're they're really in touch with all the various uh, wildlife that lives in the region, and when they're seeing things that they can't explain, then it really it really warrants some attention. We've only got about three minutes here before we got to go to break at the top of the hour. David Weatherly is our guest tonight. David, one of my favorite stories from Alaska is Japanese Airlines Flight 1680, where back in, I believe, 1988, this 747 that was on its way, supposedly, to Japan, comes in contact with about what they called about a mile to two mile long UFO. Subsequently, the pilots were brought down in Alaska, told to land, and they were interrogated. There's a lot to this story because these pilots, for the longest time, weren't even exonerated. They lost their jobs over this. Yeah, that's the that's the 86 encounter you're talking about. Or 86, about, right? pardon me, yeah. The, the, the Japan flight 1628. Okay, you schooled me again. <laughs> Well, it was, I mean, that is a fascinating case, and you're right. I mean, they they lost their jobs. It, it was, you know, you have to realize, too, that we're talking about, uh, culturally, we're talking about people that react differently to these things because, you know, Japanese professionals, they toe the line. It's not like a, a Westerner. You know, there's very strict parameters over the behavior of, professional people in japan so for these guys to come out and report this i mean it was it's it's stunning i I think a lot of people don't realize the weight of you you know behind the fact that these guys did come out and report this sighting and it's it's never been solved you know it's one of the more intriguing cases out there i know it's been uh, recreated on a couple of the programs as i recall and not that i've seen in a long time but uh, and I have not seen any real developments or anything in that that whole case either. But the the if I recall correctly, the guy who was the captain, he was a fighter pilot before yeah. being a commercial pilot. He, he so was he a, had a he was tremendous a amount of flight hours. He was, yeah, and you know he had a lot of flight flight time under his belt. Um, so you know that kind of takes it to an, an even different level because now we're talking about somebody who's an experienced military pilot and is reporting this incident. Yeah. The strange part about that was, is that out of embarrassment, Japan airlines felt that they had embarrassed the airline by reporting this UFO and the pilot, the co-pilot were fired from their jobs over it. Eventually a few years later, getting their pilot's licenses back. But I mean, that's just, shameful that at that time i guess that was the politics of it all so we got about 20 seconds well and that's what i was saying a few moments ago about the culture is that at the time it was shameful for them to do something so far out of the bounds as you know reporting a ufo exactly david i'm gonna get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour david weatherly is our guest tonight on spaced out radio getting into some spookiness Some weird stories, strange creatures, ghosts, goblins, you name it. We're going to tackle it and your questions as well if you are in our chat rooms or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio because that's what we like to do here. His website, EerieLights.com. You can find all his books there. Some of the best reads in the paranormal from David Weatherly, our guest on Spaced Out Radio. All right, my friend, we're clear. I'm going to uh, just okay. I'm just going to run the dogs outside. We got about five and a half minutes, okay? Okay, thanks. What to do? Why not get bumble fucked? 
Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble f Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hi there, this is the Paranormal Lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only... All right, buddy, I'm back. Doug says hello. All right, uh, let's put you up there so that way I can hear you, and uh, yeah, getting cold here, Dave, getting cold. How much snow do you got? I got no snow, but I could tell you this, that uh, um, haven't seen uh, positive temperatures in a couple of days. Coming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're supposed to have, according to the Farmer's Almanac, we're supposed to have a very mild temperatured winter this year and lots of snow. Okay. Lots of snow. Yeah. As long as the lake freezes, that's yeah. all I care. So I could go play uh, go play hockey with my son on the lake. That's what's fun. I'm ready. I'm ready to get up there. I'm ready to host you again. It's minus four Celsius which is uh, 25 degrees Fahrenheit right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah chilly. Yeah, I know. I was messaging. I, I want to try to get up there, you know, uh, in the spring and do a couple of those locations with uh, Mike and Jeff, have, you know, have been posting about. They've found some pretty cool places. Yeah. So, yeah, I got, a, I got a, a place for us to stay in one of those locations, too. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, it's a guy who uh, did some uh, filming and documentary work with Rob Freeman on some UFOs. Oh. 
Yeah. So he's uh, he's opening up pretty darn quick and uh, and uh, wants to uh, let us hang out. So he'll show us the ropes. Sounds good. Yeah. Good dude. Very good dude. Is it a haunted location or oh, is it a the UFO whole, hot spot or both? both? The, it's it's the trifecta, just in a different part of the oh, okay. of, of the province. Oh, it's more it. more southeast. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. Very cool. It's perfect. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> You'll be amazed by the drive. The drive is gorgeous, okay. and it's filled with old, tattered buildings and mills that haven't probably had people in them in a long time, and everything. As soon as the freaking border is open, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. dude, I hope so. I, I Trust me. Yeah. Like I said, we'll be meeting at the airport. I'll be going to Vegas. You'll be coming to BC. And <laughs> we'll right. just wave on the way by. <laughs> All right, my friend. We got uh, 15 seconds. Thank you so much to Zoe Buttercup for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Thank you for everybody who has given us a thumbs up. 123 people so far tuning us in live on YouTube. I hope you're enjoying this. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. Thank you for tuning us in. My name is Dave Scott. And we're talking all things weird tonight. We want to remind everyone that we're so appreciative if you're listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, O'Brumpent. O'Brumpent is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We've got a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. From eerielights.com, David Weatherly is here for his bi-monthly stopping by just to check it on out and talk all things strange and weird with us. You can find all of his books on his website, and I highly suggest you do. Oh, and if you hear the alarm going off behind me, that means the fire department is being called out right now. And I'm sure it has something to do with vehicle versus deer or vehicle versus moose. David's website, once again, is eerielights.com. David, welcome back. Thanks, man. Yes, we'll wait for the horn to go one more time here. Is I, oh, there it goes. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear it, but either way. I can't. No. Either way. I know sometimes they can't, the audience can't if they got the audio turned up enough. All right. One of your latest books you, you wrote with a really great paranormal investigator, Sean Austin, about shadow people, shadow chaser, the in-between is, is what it's called. You know, there's a lot of people, Dave, who claim to make uh, contact with these shadow people. What are they all about? And tell us a story about them. Well, so there's two different things there. Uh, shadow Chaser is uh, it's not specifically about shadow people. That is um, That book is a sequel to uh, the first one that was called just Shadow Chaser. The current one's called Shadow Chaser, the in-between. And I really kind of throw that over to Sean to talk about for the most part, because if you read the book, you'll see that it is, it's, it's his personal journey. It's his story. And uh, I came in as a co-writer. I know Sean pretty well. We've investigated uh, quite a bit together and, you know, he wanted to, to be able to share his story and I agreed to go in as a co-writer and just help him clarify uh, some things, so to speak. So it, it's, it's a chronicle of the different experiences that he has had over the years exploring the paranormal and his, his, uh, perspective. It's, it's a a different one than mine, uh, which is, you know, that's fine. He takes a very, uh, religious viewpoint. He's a demonologist and he's a a Catholic. So uh, it's, you know, it's kind of fascinating for me to be able to explore that aspect some, um, 
I'm slugged in enough of it to, you know, be comfortable with it. Uh, but if you want to talk shadow people uh, specifically, now that's a whole, whole different thing because uh, this is this is something that people have been experiencing for a very very long time. You know, we have ancient accounts of people talking about shadowy figures. You know, that evolved from uh, sort of the classical European phantom monk uh, all the way up into modern sightings of what people call the Hat Man. And this is a a shadowy figure that is said to be you know blacker than black. Uh, sometimes it's just a mass. Sometimes it is very well defined and looks humanoid with frequently some type of what people describe as a hat. Often it's a fedora. Uh, on occasions you'll hear variations of that. I, I've heard a couple of cases that people said, no, it looked like the shadow figure was wearing a cowboy hat. Uh, you know, so you, you get some, some different uh, things that mix in there. Most of the time, these things are, are completely solid black, but sometimes you hear stories about red eyes or glowing eyes being exhibited in the mass. And while there are some encounters that are very frightening, a good portion of them are what I would say, you know, unnerving uh, because the people say that these things are, are there, their presence, their, you know, they're uneasy. They're they're you know somewhat scared of these figures, but the encounters don't last a whole long you know very long time. Uh, so it, it's something that it's a phenomenon. I think that there's more than one explanation for, uh, because certainly on some occasions in haunted location you can have something that manifests as a shadow form, uh, but there are other cases that it seems very targeted. You know, there's a very creepy story in my Strange Intruders book uh, that came from a gentleman I interviewed, and this was quite a few years ago now, uh, but he had probably the most frightening encounter I've ever heard uh, about a shadow person. Uh, this gentleman, his name was John, and he was um, like he was overworked. He was, you know, very committed to his job, to being successful. He was a spiritual person who had fallen off of his spiritual path. And he started having some odd experiences in his home. Uh, but he, he got home one night. It was, it was late. He sat down on the side of his bed and something grabbed his ankles from under his bed and yanked him. Uh, down as if it was trying to pull him under and you know this encounter has it unfolded I, I mean he was you know he grabbed something he was holding on basically for dear life and he ended up uh, praying and he says you know defaulting back to his his belief system his faith and being uh getting out of the situation because of that is what he believes. Uh, but it, it's, it's an unusual encounter. There are, you know, some that I hear here, you know, here and there that are physical accounts uh, where these things somehow cause a physical effect or even touch a person. But that one, that one is definitely one of the creepiest that I've ever heard. Probably the creepiest shadow person story I've ever heard. Are they almost glimpses into evil? Is that what they are? Well, some people some people think so, yeah. You know, it's it's weird because a lot of people who experience these things, they see them out of their peripheral vision, you know. So it's that glimpse out of the corner of your eye. Uh, but on other occasions, people see them directly. I mean, there's accounts of people waking up in their beds at night uh, with the sense that someone is in the room. And when they they look up or set up part way and start looking around, they see a shadow figure, you know, standing at the end of their bed, staring down at them or something. So a, a whole range of these encounters, but almost universally, people say they do not feel good about these things. You know, so the big question, of course, is what exactly are we dealing with, you know, where are these things coming from? And 
what kind of, you know, what kind of manifestation are we dealing with? Is it a, a other dimensional entity? Because that's certainly what it sounds like in a lot of the cases. Uh, but of course, many people believe that there's some type of, of spiritual entity, you know, something that uh, is the, the shade of someone who's passed, for instance. And it's really, um, it, it's, it's one of the puzzles, I think, in the paranormal that has been around for a very long time, and we still have a lot of answers to. Because, you know, like I said, you can really trace the origins of these things pretty far back. David, a lot of people, when they see shadow people, they're always dark or black. Yet, I have a person in the chat room earlier on, and I apologize, I can't remember who was asking it, was asking about white shadow people, like white shadow figures. Have you ever heard of these? I, I've heard a few variations. You know, I, I've heard someone who saw a blue figure, for instance, and uh, a couple of other variations. So, it's much more unusual but yes, I, I have heard different versions of that. We still don't have an answer, of course, for what they are. Uh, and I haven't seen any variations in the experience that people have in, with these things in terms of, you know, not feeling good about them. So whatever these entities are, you know, uh, who knows why they manifest slightly different to some people. That is just strange. David Weatherly is our guest tonight on Space Out Radio. We wouldn't be remiss being a Halloween season if we talked about some haunting stuff, okay? And this is a time of year, David, where all of a sudden the Ouija boards get dusted off, people start thinking about seances, trying to communicate with spirits <laughs> on the other side. You know, I, I know we've talked numerous times about Ouija boards on this show, but especially at this time of the year where communication seems to be more prevalent with the public, it's not something that just anybody should do, is it? You know, I always say that uh, we we have talked about this topic on air before, and it, it's a very uh, it divides a lot of people. That's for sure, <laughs> because there's so many people that say no, they're you know they're satanic, they're evil, they're you know blah blah blah, and there's other people that say no, no, there's nothing you know nothing can happen with them, and I really kind of fall in the middle of, on this. You know, I, I don't believe that they're satanic tools. Uh, I've heard countless stories of people have reported to me about the the Ouija board that can't be destroyed. You know, it's, you know, we tried to burn it, we tried to break it, and my first response every time hearing those stories is, "Bring it to me." You know, I I want to. See. If you've got a board, and if anybody's listening, you've got one of these boards that that you know purportedly can't be destroyed. You let me know. I I'll take it uh, because I've yet to see such a thing. Uh, and, you know, sadly, it's always a story, you know, a friend of a friend heard this story or, you know, uh, such and such told them the tale. Now, all of that being said, it's important to understand that these are tools that allow a part of your consciousness to communicate with something. And you have to take proper precautions if you're going to do that. I, I think one of the Worst things that happens with these bad, these negative situations involving Ouija boards is that someone really doesn't understand what they're doing. They fling the door open and things happen. You know, I mean, if Dave, if you lived in a bad part of town, you know, you wouldn't fling your front door open and shout out, hey, anybody wants to come in, come on. <laughs> You know, and just leave it standing open. But that's what happens in the spiritual sense with these boards. You know, these people, often teenagers or preteens, you know, they will sit down with one of these boards and they will do what they've seen on television or something, you know, and they'll just start, oh, any anyone that wants to talk, you know, is there anyone here who will communicate with us? And, yeah, you're flinging that door open and you're saying, hey, anybody – that wants to come in, come in. And that's a, that's an invitation for negative entities to indeed come in and say, Oh yeah, it's, you know, we've got an open invitation here. So let's, you know, let's pretend we're, you know, uncle Fred or whatever and start communicating. And, you know, 
these people are fascinated because they're receiving communication, but they've opened the door and they never close it either, you know, because what happens when they, they're finished, you know, they say, okay, well, we're going to stop now, you know, and that's it. So if you're going to use a tool like that or any kind of tool like that to communicate with spirit, you have to, you have to put some parameters up and you have to, you have to find a process that works for you and fits with your belief system, but also offers you protection and sets a clear precedent for what you're willing to communicate and what you're not. Okay. So, so for people at this time of year, when they, you know, they want to get spooky and they want to get scared on Halloween. The problem is the majority of them are not trying to talk to, you know, great aunt Esther or, or uncle Norm from back in the day. They're, they're wanting to talk to the devil. They're always going after the devil, Beelzebub, any of devil's satanic children that are running around, things that can harm you, Dave. I mean, you you practice what you preach when it comes to something like this communication board. Oh, sure. And, you know, if somebody's uh, openly looking to communicate with something like that, then they're going to find a way to do it, you know, and it doesn't matter, you know, what anyone's opinion on, on the proper use of it is. You know, that's that's what they're going to achieve. So what's the scariest thing that's ever happened while you were on a Ouija board? Have you ever had anything weird? No. No, no. Um, I had a strange, I, I'll tell you one thing that was strange. You know who Darren Evans is? No. Uh, Dar- Darren was well known because he was the guy who kind of broke, broke the whole Zozo uh, case wide open with uh you know purportedly there's an entity called zozo a zozo that has come through all over the world when people have been using ouija boards and it's a it's a very negative entity uh darren wrote a book on the topic and <clears throat> he's he's an old hand at using ouija boards that's kind of his thing well about, uh, I can't remember, this is uh, over a year ago, um, he and I and a good friend of mine, Joshua Warren, uh, went out to a location in Nevada that is known for uh, being a UFO hotspot. And <laughs> Darren broke out a Ouija board and he and I started using it and we got a communication from something calling itself K1. And, you know, the whole thing was just kind of odd. And it was, it was a bit fascinating because there's not really many people trying to use a board for those purposes. Like you said, you know, most people are looking for uh, the devil or whatever when they're using these things. Uh, but really, uh, there are some cases from the contactee movement in the 1950s where, you know, some of the contactees were purportedly using Ouija boards in order to try to communicate with aliens. So what we had coming through, I don't know, but I tell you, it was, it was a very strange thing. Hmm. Very interesting indeed. Joe has a question for you in the chat room and he is asking, do they print on the box that Ouija board comes in on how to protect yourself? No, you have to realize too, you know, this is uh Ouija was originally a game and there's a famous Norman Rockwell painting. If you guys know who he was, uh, painted a lot of, you know, depictions of, Americana for Saturday evening post and different publications. And, uh, there's a painting that he did of a couple using a Ouija board. So, you know, these things were created during a period when social norms, uh, you know, were that men and women had to keep a certain distance from each other to be, you know, correct. And, and, you know, within the proper parameters and, uh, this game comes along it was played originally was that uh, it was advised that the best way to use the Ouija board was for a man and woman to sit, you know, with the board on their knees facing each other, you know, so knee to knee and and both of them could put their hands on the planchette. So it was a way for 
um, flirtatious activity, so to speak. <laughs> and, you know, of course, it, it developed from there. And by the time we hit the 1960s and the whole uh, the 60s and 70s with the whole movement towards various uh, occult ideas and uh, the fascination with the, the Aquarian age and, you know, everything mystical was suddenly hip. So they became very popular during that period and, you know, much more uh, common for people to utilize to try to contact spirits rather than something that was seen more as a game. We don't really get the evil turn uh, in the Ouija board mythos until the, oh, like the 1980s, there was a movie that came out. And I, I can't remember the date. I'm sorry, but there was a movie that came out called Witchboard. And it was one of a whole onslaught of films that depicted the Ouija board used in a, a highly negative fashion. Now, right before that, the first exposure was really in The Exorcist because The Exorcist story, of course, uh, has the use of a Ouija board. And we all know how much that movie terrified people when it came out initially. So, you know, we get that as a, a precursor. It wasn't the entire focus of the movie. Uh, but then later on, we get Witchboard, which is, you know, completely centered around this talking board. And uh, like I said, from, from there, we had a whole glut of, you know, B movies that focused on a Ouija boards, you know, open the gates of hell and so forth. Oh, that's pleasant. That's pleasant. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Yeah, but I, I mean, it, the thing is it changed people's perception, you know, because that's what the mainstream media does. True. Very true. All right. Uh, Jenny is asking, what is the strangest experience you've ever had, David? Oh, gosh. Um, the strange, that's, that's a tough one because I, I've had a lot of weird experiences. Um, maybe the grinning man sighting that, that was a pretty weird, it was a pretty weird thing. Uh, the grinning man is a figure that, uh, John Keel wrote about him. Uh, there's a, fairly small number of cases of people who have seen this figure uh, often associated with UFO sightings, uh, but a, a very bizarre looking humanoid figure with a strange grin. And I saw one of these figures in the 1980s in North Carolina. Uh, a friend and I were just kind of out exploring. We were in a remote part uh, in a remote area, not many houses or anything. And, uh, you know, no other cars on the road or anything. It was daytime and we're cruising along. I was in the passenger seat on this occasion. And as we came around a curve, uh, I looked ahead and I saw a figure standing on the side of the road. Now this in itself was highly unusual because you just, like I said, it was rare. You know, houses were many miles apart back there. So you just didn't see people. And, uh, this figure was standing on the side of the road in some high grass, and he was he was facing our direction. And as we approached him, I kind of, of course, locked, you know, my uh, my sight on this figure to try to see what it was. And I uh, saw that it was a man. He was wearing uh, a long coat. He had a, a top hat on, and he had a uh, beneath the the coat. You could see this very wide, shiny belt, you know, some kind of metallic wow. belt. And uh, he had his right hand was under his chin, yep. and he was rubbing his, his thumb and fingers together. Hold that thought right there. Here's... Hold that thought right there because I totally mismanaged the clock on this one, David. We got to go to break <laughs> on Spaced Out Radio. David will continue with his weirdest encounter right after this. My bad, my friend. I totally mismanaged the clock on that one. Sorry about that. No worries. 
I hate when I ha when that happens. Hate it. The internal argument inside of me has now begun. How could you do that, Dave? <laughs> How could you do that? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. All right. Let's see here. Go way back. Chat room is jammed. There's a bunch of questions coming for you once we get this thing right. going. And hopefully the chat room doesn't scroll up too much where I lose some of them. But that'll happen. Yeah, good old Merle's waiting for you guys to come back up, man. It's all he talks about. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Him and I had, had a big good time. Yeah, we had a good time yesterday, man. We had a good time right. yesterday. All I, I The only thing that kind of upset me about the entire day was that it was right along the uh, river and the salmon are running, and I literally would have had about 400 yards of beach to fish. And I didn't bring my rod or reel. Yeah. Mm hmm. That hurt. That really hurt. But I like so you it. took the cam you took the cameras away from the uh gifting site, huh? Yeah. Well it's my buddy Mike's. I don't have any. It was my buddy Mike's. Oh, okay. So gotcha. he had got one ripped <laughs> off already. But you you know what's really yeah. gonna piss me off is I'm gonna try and go out there this weekend. And it's going to bug the daylights out of me, man, if all of a sudden I go there and stuff is moved again. Because I know <laughs> it's going to be out there. Uh, not much. I have my son wanted to put a pair of uh, his toy cars out there. We have three marbles in sitting in the tree. Uh, we have a um, this purple thing. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's sitting in the tree. We got a rubber basketball, which I'm not sure. I, did I send you the pictures? Uh, I thought I did. Let me check. Oh, how silly of me. I didn't even send you this. Hold on. Sending them to your Facebook right now of the small... Hmm rubber basketball that we got at the dollar store. I think you saw these on Instagram. I think I did, actually. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, that was kind of weird. Yeah. To me, they look like fingers. What What's the... But what marked it up? Could you tell? Is that dirt? Is it clay? Is I, it, I, you what know is what? That? I don't know. What I do know is I made a very rookie mistake, and I was trying to get my phone on camera, so I pressed the ball to my to my jacket, not realizing that I pressed the that side to my jacket. Okay, and it all came off. It, but I did feel it. It felt almost, it, it didn't feel like dirt. It felt almost greasy. Was that where those marks are? Was that the side that was upright? No, that's the interesting part. That was on the ground. Yeah, so anytime you come across something like that, you need a series of photographs from where it is initially so that you can capture everything around it. And, you know, you photograph it before you move it at all, and you always want to use something else to move it. So, you know, just on the off chance, you've got DNA on there. Oh, I've got the after. I'm, I'm sending you the after right now. That's where it was found. Uh, this is, I'll show you the beforehand. Hold on. Uh, the beforehand is right here. Uh, 
Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just weird, whatever that, whatever is marked. I mean, there's nothing on the ground or on the tree or anything else that matches oh, that here, color, whatever that is. Here we go, ball. bud. Here we go. Hold on. Right. Uh, five seconds. I'm bad on the clock tonight. Hold on. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we continue on with the man behind EerieLights.com, David Weatherly, the renaissance man of everything strange and weird, and he's got the great hair and the top hat to prove it. David, welcome back. Thanks, man. You were talking about a story where you were really freaked out that something strange, your weirdest story, you were describing it. Well, no, I didn't say I was freaked out. <laughs> but I will say it was certainly a very strange incident uh, and you know, involved this figure standing on the side of a road in a remote area of North Carolina. And has, as I was telling, when we approached this figure, the weird thing was this, Dave. Uh, it was one of those moments where time sort of seemed to slow down, or at least for a moment it did. And as I'm looking at this figure, uh, what I saw was he had his right hand up under his chin, and he was rubbing his fingers and, and thumb together. Now, the most bizarre thing about this figure is that he had an impossibly large grin. My first thought when I saw this thing was the Joker, you know, from the the, the Batman villain, uh, because it was just this bizarre, such a bizarre expression. And I'm looking at this thing through the windshield at first, and then I turned and looked through the passenger window as we passed it, and he, the entire time, is staring right at us. He's staring down into the car. Now, this moment of moving past this thing is, is when time seemed to distort or something. But as soon as we were beyond, as soon as he was out of my vision in the passenger window, I whipped around in the other direction so I could look out the back window of the car. And in that brief couple of seconds, he was now standing in the center of the road looking at us as we drove away, which, you know, is physically impossible for him to move that distance in, in those brief seconds. So my buddy Tom, who was driving, uh, was not as fascinated by it as me. <laughs> you know, he's, he's going on about this as, you know, it's, it's probably some psycho that's out here, you know, whatever. And I, I'm yelling at Tom to stop the car, uh, which, you know, we, we rounded the curve and, you know, I, it, he's, he's ready to keep driving. And I'm telling him, you know, just at least turn around. Let's go back and see if he's still there. I finally, after a couple of moments, got Tom to, to turn around to drive back. And he's telling me, okay, we're only going part way just to see if he's still out there. And, uh, which we did, we, you know, we rounded the curve again, uh, close to it. And I, Tom stopped and I promptly jumped out of the car, <laughs> much, much to his displeasure. And, uh, you know, ran down the rest of the way to the location where this guy had been standing and no physical evidence on the road. However, there was a spot uh, in the weeds on the side of the road where it was clear that it, there was an impression as if someone had been standing there. 
So otherwise, this figure had vanished completely. There was no sign of him anywhere. That is strange. Yeah. That is totally strange. Very, very bizarre figure. And there's there's a bit more to the story, but I won't. I, we won't go into all of that tonight. It, it's chronicled in Strange Intruders, if anyone's really interested in this. This Grinning Man figure is something that has popped up on occasion uh, with various cases over the years. Like I said, John Keel had documented a, a couple of cases involving him, and there are some other incidents, too. So I don't know if that's the weirdest, but it's certainly it's it's one of the strangest things. And that was and that was the early '80s, so it's kind of early in my career, and it, it you know certainly left an impression. All right, mere person is asking, David, have you or anybody you know or close to you ever been affected by what they call the hitchhiker phenomena? Uh, I have not been uh, affected by that. I assume you're talking about the hitchhiker, uh, the the ghost lore surrounding the hitchhiker. It's, it's interesting that comes up because that's really uh, that's one of the most fascinating ghost legends, I think. And of course, it roots uh, very much with the story of Resurrection Mary in Chicago. Uh, I think that's one of the the best ghost stories out there. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, you know, it's this, uh, it's this tale about a, a figure who's on the scene on the side of the road and is offered a ride and uh, turns out to be a spirit because they vanish. There's a lot of variations of it. You find uh, ghostly hitchhikers all over the world, really. And some of the variations include... You know, the person being affected very directly. Uh, some of the crazy ghost stories talk about you know, the person's hair ch- turning to white after having the experience. Or uh, sometimes the story is that they they reach the address that they were asked to take the person to. And that's when the hitchhiker disappears. When they go to the door, they find out that, oh, yes, well, that was my daughter who died, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. So it's... Yeah, it's a fascinating story. Resurrection Mary is uh, a story that dates to the 1930s, and it happened on Archer Avenue. In fact, I've been to that location, uh, you know, where the Resurrection Mary story takes place. Uh, 1930s, people reported picking up this girl. Uh, There's a story of a, a gentleman who danced with her and then agreed to take her home. And all these people that give Mary a ride home, the address proves to be a cemetery. And when they reach the destination, she, of course, vanishes. So this Resurrection Mary story, its uh, I, I've dug into it quite a bit, and I found that there are actually even older roots to that tale because uh, there's a church in the area that is haunted. And the church has a legend about a um, a couple who were killed in a carriage accident, and purportedly the the girl has continued to haunt the location. So we're looking at a very very old tradition, you know, as pre pre motorized vehicle in the same place. We're talking about uh, you know a ghostly girl on the road. So. Uh, very fascinating story and i'm sorry i rambled a little bit there but yeah long and short no i i haven't experienced a ghostly hitchhiker myself no well i don't want to that just sounds all worlds <laughs> of creepy let's go over to the ukrainian watermelon ron here little ronnie Moniak from saskatchewan ron stand up and wave for everybody because it's so flat where you are everyone in north america will be able to see you and he is asking david could you please talk a little bit on attachments and spiritual courting of an entity to an individual. Right. So, uh, wow, that's a big topic. Ron wants to throw out there. <laughs> First of all, how you doing, Ron? Good to hear from you. Uh, attachments. Yeah. So a lot of times, uh, these haunted locations that people are going to, um, the ones that are more active, you know, sometimes they carry things home with them. And this goes back to protecting yourself again, really. Like we were talking about with the Ouija board, uh, we get situations where people go into um, 
locations that are very active, maybe have some spirits who aren't so nice, and they're looking for something to attach to in the physical world, something that they can interact with on a regular basis. And if you're going there investigating and trying to make contact with them, uh, again, you're opening the door. And if you're not prepared for the potential of something trying to follow you, then you can have some serious issues from it. And, you know, sometimes these things will try very hard to, to follow you. They will um, cause a, a whole range of issues for people who just ignore the topic. Everything from, you know, emotional distress to physical illness, um, you know, I hear some investigators say that, well, you know, they, they, they really can't affect you. And uh, I don't believe that. I, I believe that they can indeed affect you uh, to, you know, to different degrees because humans have, the human body has an energy field. And this is something that is, you know, it's been accepted by science in recent years. Uh, but again, it's, it's an age old cultural idea that, uh, from different traditions around the world, that the human body has an energy field, you know, beyond just our physical form. And there are things that take place in that energy field that uh, a lot of people ignore uh, because they, they don't have that uh, belief or that level of awareness. But um, if you look at things like the Chinese concept of chi, for instance, that's talking about the human energy field. Now, if you except even if just for a moment, if you accept that the human body has an energy field, then, you know, just imagine what's happening if that energy field is interacting with uh, a spirit, you know, something that doesn't have a physical form. Uh, that's where a lot of these things come in. I've seen, I've seen seasoned investigators get sick at locations, you know, where they're, they're vomiting or having other severe things, you know, bad headaches and so forth. Uh, all from some energetic reaction that's going on between them and the presence at the home. Worst case scenarios, something malicious will try to follow you because it wants it wants that continued stimulus. You know, it has its hooks in somebody, and uh, it can it can harass people for a long time if they don't do something about it. So, in terms of protection, again, I, I tell people. You know, you need to you need to find what is comfortable for you and your spiritual viewpoints. Uh, you know, a Catholic prayer won't work for someone who's Buddhist, and that's a mistake made by a lot of uh, teams that go in and, and try to clear a location. You know, if you're <laughs> if you're going into a household where the people don't have uh, that type of spiritual belief and you're trying to clear something for them, it, it's not going to work. Not really, maybe temporarily, but overall it's not going to have the effect that you hope it will. All right, let's move on to another question here. Princess Denali is asking, David, do you know the orig origin pardon me, of the Ouija board? Uh, it was invented as a game, and um, the talking board, it was, you know, it was uh, one of a whole series of them that was created uh, for that purpose. If you go back and look at the, the whole history of them, you'll find uh, different variations. There was a, a glut of talking boards, for instance, in the, the 40s and 50s, but you know, originally the idea was uh, to simply create a game and, yeah, centered around spirit communication. But um, the original Ouija was sold to who is the Parker Brothers, I think, is who owns it now. Uh, and, you know, of course, they made a, a fortune with it. It's just that simple. That simple. All right. Moving on here, as we have about eight minutes to go before we go to the top of the hour here on Spaced Out Radio with Mr. David Weatherly. David, you know, we've talked a little bit about, about shadow people. We've talked a little bit about ghosts. But around this time, 
you know, people aren't looking up to the sky for UFOs. Does this time of the year when the veil is thinner, do they bring more aliens around? Do we got aliens more around this time of year? Hard to say. I, I think that a lot more people are looking to the sky simply because UFOs have been in the news so much recently. You know, with with all the things that have been emerging um, this year in particular regarding the government's uh, projects to look at UFOs and so forth, I think that a lot of people are a bit more conscious of it. The, the people who are going out of their houses, at least, <laughs> you know, because of the lockdowns and everything. So I don't know. I, I don't think historically, I don't think there's any uptick in sightings necessarily around this time of year. No. All right, so out of all the UFO cases, and we've heard them all, from Calvin Parker to Betty and Barney Hill to Travis Walton, Chris Bledsoe, is there a case outside of those that really sticks with you that you think, man, there is a place where I would have liked to be? You mean one that I have not investigated? Maybe you have. Maybe there's that, that hidden mean? gem out there that really hasn't been as popular as many others. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Zanfretta case uh, from Italy. Definitely one of my favorites. And that, that's a that's a whole series of encounters that took place. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of mind-boggling that more people don't know this story. And I wrote about it, uh, did a brief synopsis of it, and strange intruders. And I get asked about it fairly frequently because people, people who read that book, you know, even people who are really interested in UFOs, they've never heard the story before. Uh, but the, the case is, is fascinating because multiple witnesses, we had the Italian military police were involved. There was a, it was a case opened by them, uh, you know, the physical evidence. So, this is a situation, and, and there's there's lots of parts of the case, but I'll give you the, the basic beginning of it was a, a gentleman who was a security guard was out on his rounds one night, and his job was to uh, – he had a car, and he would drive up to these homes uh, that were owned by, by people who were um, – uh, paying for additional security to make sure that, you know, no one messed with their homes when they were, um, you know, out of the country or, or whatever. So he had driven up to this little village to check on this house that was owned by a doctor. And he got there uh, that night and spotted lights behind the house. And he thought, okay, well, this is, um, you know, intruders or something, and I'm going to, to get the drop on them. So he gets out of his car. Uh, he slips around back behind the house. And uh, he finds intruders, all right, but it wasn't what he expected. He encounters these aliens that he <laughs> he described them as having – undulating skin and uh, there is a drawing you can probably find it online uh, that he did of these things they're very creepy looking uh, he, he finds himself confronting these alien creatures he passes out and he he ends up the patrol company had sent additional um, guys up to help with the situation because, you know, they were still assuming this is a break-in or something. So these other patrol officers reach the area, and they find him, uh, San Fred, in just this, you know, highly agitated, panicked state. Um, and, you know, a whole series of things unfolds from that. But here's the thing, Dave. This case, uh, they ended up finding, I think it was 26 witnesses in this little village who had seen these strange lights in the sky right before Zanfreda's encounter. Uh, impressions were found in the soil that it looked like something had landed, but no one could identify what it was. Uh, as the story unfolded, uh, Zanfreda had other encounters with these aliens. 
And the the Italian, the military police investigated the claims. They found trace evidence. They found strange things that had happened. And eventually they decided uh, for whatever reason that they weren't going to dig into this anymore. So they rubber stamped the file, no crime committed, case closed, and just refused to look at it anymore. Zanfreda, he had a whole series of things happen to him because the media got a hold of this story. This was in the 1970s. Uh, the media got a hold of it. And, you know, here's this fairly simple, you know, man just trying to, to live his life. Uh, he's suddenly ridiculed and people are making fun of him, of him because of, you know, he's claiming flying saucers and aliens and all these things. So uh, he was very upset at the way the media was portraying him. Eventually, in order to try to repair his reputation, he did some interviews, and he did an interview on live television. He was dosed with truth serum and asked a series of questions about this encounter, and his story remained the same. Wow. So... You know, some stunning aspects to this case, really stunning aspects to it. David Weatherly is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We have about two and a half minutes before we're going to go to break here at the top of the hour. David, with this gentleman in Italy and his case being, you know, and his word being so so fluid and his story never changing, did he ever admit to being a, a lifelong ET contactee? Did he ever admit to to having previous contact with these sentient beings? Not prior to what he, you know, to the initial case. However, he did have closer contact with them. And in fact, the sort of kicker to this case is that at one point he was given this sphere by the aliens. And they told him to give this thing to a gentleman named, named Dr. Heinick. Now, Zanfretta had no idea who this was because he wasn't interested in UFOs. So the story is that he buried this thing uh, up in the hills somewhere and just left it there, and it, it never reached Heinick. Uh, now, you know, wouldn't it be something to find that? <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. And there's all these hidden gems like that out there, aren't there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, everybody, uh, they put all their attention on the Roswell or you know, the Travis Walton abduction or whatever. And those those are important cases, but I think that we can learn so much more by delving into some of these lesser-known accounts and, you know, pursuing them a bit more than they have been. With 30 seconds, 35 seconds to go here, I, I'm curious, why do we keep concentrating on all of these elderly accounts if there's so many better stories that are left unknown, maybe potentially better evidence as well? Well, question, isn't it? I mean, I think to a degree, you know, some of it is media attention. You know, certainly everybody leaps right to the Roswell thing. And, and for a long time, it was seen as being, you know, the smoking gun or whatever, Roswell and, and Area 51. Uh, but, you know, we have to question at a certain point, is that just a diversion? Is that what they want us to keep focusing on? Because there's just not enough there. And, and you know, look at what this hand is doing, but don't pay attention to what's in this hand. And the other hand that people are paying attention to is a whole range of incredible cases with, you know, multiple witnesses, uh, physical evidence, and, and, you know, Lord knows what else. David Weatherly will be with us for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. He's one of the best storytellers when it comes to everything strange and weird. His website, eerielights.com. David will be with us till the bottom of the hour. Then we'll get into the SOR Newswire. The Thought of the Dave, Space Out Radio continues with Hour 3 next. Clear. All right, I'm just going to, uh, 
run the dogs out one final time here, Dave. I'll be right back, boss. All right. Why not get Bumble fucked? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble f- Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Space Air Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Space Air Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Sorry about that, Davey. Uh, deer were in the yard. Took a little bit longer to get the dogs in. No problem. Yes. Yeah, Merle and I go all the way out to uh, this area. There's supposed to be lots of moose out there, lots of grizzly bears out there. Wolves see Nothing. 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 It's like, damn it. I think I want to see this stuff. <laughs> Crazy. I know. I know. Let's see here. Seeing, seeing what our audience is wanting here. <clears throat> no, Penny, I did not wear the raw meat suit to attract the wolves and bears. I did not. 
Good night, Fast Hemi. All right. We got about uh, just over one minute, David. Just over one minute. Okay. Anywhere in particular you want to go, or do you want the audience to take <clears throat> it? No, I'll let them decide. It's fine. All right. You guys pick. Where do you want to go this last half hour with David? Otherwise, i got to come up with it, which is all right, because I've done that before. I can do it again. <laughs> About 35 seconds. <clears throat> All right, questions are coming in for you, Dave. And we got about 15 seconds. <clears throat> Five seconds. And here we go. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that we do appreciate everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and, of course, digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Obrumpent. Obrumpent is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking with David Weatherly for the final time, and we are talking about everything regarding strange and weird leading up to Halloween and this great day that we all get to dress up, and some of us at least in North America will get to go trick-or-treating, like me and my boy. Anyways, David's website, eerielights.com. He is one of the best there is in this business. And, David, we always love it when we get to welcome you back. Always a good time. All right, my friend. Questions from the audience here. Xavier wants to know what you think of the Marfa lights. You know, that's... um... That's an interesting thing because we've got these ghost lights that appear in you know, different locations uh, around the world. Of course, the best known Marfa lights are the Brown Mountain lights in North Carolina. And uh, ultimately, I think that they are most likely some type of uh, phenomena, you know, earth related phenomena that's occurring. It's interesting, though, because every time, you know, someone thinks they have it figured out, a uh, scientist or a researcher or whatever, uh, it seems to confound them. So, I don't know. It's it, it's a fascinating phenomenon, that's for sure. Are you leaning towards aliens? Or are you leaning towards some sort of human or or just <clears throat> earthly phenomena? No, I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it's human. Uh, but I, I don't think that it's alien either. I think that it's some type of uh, interaction that's taking place with. Uh, you know, some people call them earth lights. Uh, you know, there's indications that these things are, uh, there's a lot of different theories that have been posed over the years. You know, sometimes they're, uh, supposed to be atmospheric, uh, you know, in some way, sometimes they're connected to earthquake activity and it's really hard to say, but I do think that it's some type of interaction that's taking place in the natural world that we just don't completely understand. What, uh, yeah. Anyway, Ron wants to know what your thoughts are on flat earth. He's a flat earther, by the way. Oh, my God. Ron's a flat earther. (laughs) 
You know, I, I think he has too much Saskatchewan in his blood. Is that, is that because he can't see any mountains where he is? Probably. Probably. <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh! You know my favorite, um, my favorite commentary on that is the <laughs> yeah, the internet meme that said that the Earth can't be flat because if it was, cats would have already pushed everything over the edge. And uh, that probably says everything about it. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with you. That's about as far as we need to go on that one, Kevin. I, I yeah. like this question because we've never really discuss this probably we have over the amount of shows that you and i have done but uh, we haven't done in a long time he's asking about whether or not you astral travel uh i do yes that's something that you know came uh something i experienced early in my life and then of course came to understand more about it when i begin to study various shamanic traditions so uh yeah i sure do do you still do it often uh, i do yes you can you can reach a state where you can do it um you know when you choose to a lot of people who start having those experiences it's uh spontaneous you know and they don't they think it's a dream or you know they don't understand completely what's happening but when you start studying various traditions there are uh, different ways that you can learn how to do that consciously if you choose to. All right, let's move on to mere person's question. David, what is your opinion on altered states and the paranormal? Um, well, is there a specific question there or just a general? I guess I mean, that, that could... it's, it's just a generalized <laughs> question. I'm not even sure how to approach that because there's so many different ways I could answer it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm just not sure what exactly is being asked. If it's just a general question, then, you know, we could take it as, okay, well, uh, altered states do come into play. That kind of reflects back on what we were talking about earlier in the show, this concept of, how is the uh, participant, you know, how is the person witnessing the phenomena contributing to what's happening? Uh, are they doing so because they've entered some kind of an altered state and they're having this experience? You know, some, some uh, encounters would suggest that the person is in some kind of altered state during the event. You know, there's a lot of similarities, for instance, in – uh, the old folklore, of, you'll love this, Dave, of uh, abductions by the fairy people. Uh, so, you know, these people were abducted by, uh, humans were abducted, abducted by the little people and taken into another world of, uh, of existence, you know, into the world of the fae. And you start reading these accounts, and it sounds on the one level very uh, mystical and kind of shamanic, and on another level it sounds like we're talking about uh, then going into an altered state of consciousness. And weirdly enough, you can look at those encounters and say, well, these kind of sound like modern UFO abductions if you strip away the, the cultural parameters of you know aliens and little people and just look at the bare bones of the encounter. So what's happening here is so are these people going into a spontaneous you know state of altered consciousness, and that's why they're having the experience? Big questions. What about using psychedelics like like ayahuasca in order to try and heighten the experience of the paranormal or extraterrestrial contact? Well, I, I think you have to be careful when you start talking about that because on the one hand, there are uh, parameters for doing that. And on the other hand, you know, it depends on how you're trying to approach it because of course, uh, you know, I certainly don't advise anyone to go on an investigation, for instance, and, you know, use any kind of substance, whether it's alcohol or uh, any kind of mind-altering substance or, or whatever. Uh, that opens people up to a whole range of dangers. Uh, but under proper conditions to explore something spiritually, uh, you know, with a proper guide and so forth, then there is a the potential 
for reaching a different level of experience or understanding about some of these topics. And when you really start delving into the, some of the shamanic cultures that use uh, these altering substances, you'll find that they freely talk about uh, other worlds of existence, you know, aliens, uh, other dimensions, and so forth. And this is one of the ways that they've gathered their information and their tribal lore about these topics. All right, let's move on here because I know we have more questions. And let's go to Jules here, who is asking in regards to light beings. What are they? Well, kind of the opposite of shadow people in a sense. I mean, there's a lot of accounts of people seeing... uh, Beings that look like they're made of light, sometimes these are perceived as guardian angels, sometimes they're perceived as, uh, you know, relatives or ancestors that are in the spirit world who are there not to harm us, but to protect us or guide us during critical moments or, you know, sometimes to save people from situations. Uh, There are a surprising number of encounters with angels, for instance, and, you know, those are usually described as being... Uh, beings made of light that came in and uh, averted an accident or or did something else. And, you know, I think that uh, the universe tries to balance things. So just as we have these weird shadow people running around, we're going to have the opposite side of that, and that's a, a more beneficial entity that's trying to help rather than harm. All right, let us uh, move on here because... We want to continue on with the audience questions here on Spaced Out Radio. Susan is wondering if you ever studied the Allegheny creature. Uh, Not closely, no. What is that creature? Uh, Is she talking about the one from... uh... I don't, there's there's an Allegheny. Uh, I'm not sure which one she's talking about because there's a couple. There's Allegheny County in North Carolina, and there's an Allegheny in Pennsylvania. Um, she, in Pennsylvania, yeah. Um, and there's a oh, you know the. If she's talking about the Allegheny, um, there's one that's a Loch Ness type of creature. That's the Pennsylvania one. Uh, so I'm assuming that's what she's talking about. It's a water monster, uh, and I've I've not uh, I've not studied that closely. But that whole that whole county that county is uh, I think is around. Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly. And, uh, yeah, it's around Pittsburgh, yep. Pennsylvania. And there's a lot, there's a lot of encounters in that whole region, not just a, uh, creature. There's, there's Bigfoot sightings up there. There's, um, a lot of UFO accounts and it's kind of a hot spot that region is. Yeah. Black Panther sightings have been in that area too. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. Yeah, but I think I assume I assume that she's talking about the one. I can't remember the the name of the lake right off, but there is a a lake in that county that purportedly has a water monster in it, and that's the uh, um, that's probably the one that she's talking about. Is the that's the Allegheny creature she's talking about, I believe. But there's so many of these lake monsters, you know, that um, it's. It's really fascinating to look at the consistencies of them because, of course, everybody knows, you know, Loch Ness, but uh, all over America there are lake monsters. And, uh, you know, they're often described as being these, uh, you know, messy looking, long necked creatures that have lived in there for a very long time. Often there's native lore that surrounds the creature, too, that goes, you know, far back in oral tradition. So, uh, it's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. All right. I like Corrence's question here. He is saying, do we ever hear of stories of ghosts craving food that they loved in this lifetime? <laughs> well, um, 
Yeah, occasionally. I mean, if you go to Asia, uh, what you find is the Hungry Ghost Festival that's held every year. And the idea there is that the deceased do indeed uh, consume food in a way. Uh, so the concept there is that spirits uh, that they call hungry ghosts uh, can roam the streets. And if you're not careful, they will find their way into your home. So in order to appease these wandering spirits, uh, food is left out. For them, and there's a there's an annual festival that is considered to be the time to feed these people. These are people that uh, became wandering spirits because they weren't honored by their relatives, or they, you know, they died uh, alone. Uh, they're, um, you know, they weren't shown the proper. Or weren't given a proper burial or weren't shown the proper respect after their death. Uh, so they become lost. Now, sometimes uh, the other side of that is that sometimes these spirits are people who did terrible things in life, and they're sort of doomed to this uh, in-between world that puts them in a, a place that um, leaves them craving things, you know, craving uh, foods, for instance, or uh, craving other things of the physical world, and they will try to attach themselves. They will try to uh, consume the energy of food, and uh, you know these uh, different rituals that are done uh, to appease them. Uh, the idea is to to keep them happy, so they don't uh, they don't attach to you, and they don't cause problems for your household. All right, let's move on here because we have a few more questions from our audience. David Weatherly is our guest. Brian is asking, uh, recently on this show, Grant Cam Cameron used the term permission slip to describe a contact modality. Does a Ouija board, witchcraft, psychedelics provide permission to make contact with the other side? Uh I assume that he means does it provide contact to the spirits? Yeah, I absolutely believe that it does. And uh, simply because of the parameters that people use or the lack of parameters that people use when they're uh, making use of a lot of those items. So the Ouija board being the most common, of course, uh, you know, there, there's there's no real standard for how people are utilizing these things. They don't do anything to protect themselves, to clear the space or anything else. Like I said before, they just kind of fling the door open. So, yeah, that is that is throwing out a very defined and open-ended invitation and, and permission slip, if you will, that says, hey, you know, whoever's out there, come and, come and communicate. And you just don't know what you're going to get. You really don't. April is wondering, what kind of tools do you use for your own investigations? Uh, depends on what I'm investigating, uh, but, you know, I have, um, I, I've done this long enough that when I started, <laughs> you know, it was really bare bones. It was, you know, a, a pen and a pad to take note and take notes and interview witnesses and, uh, you know, a recorder eventually and a camera. Uh, but, you know, of course, in modern times, we had the benefit of a, a whole wide range of equipment. So, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes I go into a place really fully loaded with everything from, you know, infrared and night vision to uh, SLS camera and, and various recorders. And uh, sometimes I do things, you know, completely old school and, you know, throw the baby powder on the floor and, <laughs> You know, just uh, uh, really approach it from a different direction. So I, I try to tailor that to the individual uh, case and history of what's going on in order to, you know, have the best chance of gathering evidence. At some point, David, what conclusions would you like to see in your lifetime? Wow. Um, just about any of this, you mean? Just, okay. 
if you if if David Weatherly I mean, I... if David Weatherly had a couple of these incidences or creatures that you could prove exists or life after death exists or aliens are from you know Mars or wherever what would you like to prove before or see proven before your time is done on this planet well i think you know probably the big ones in in each of those categories i i mean it would be fascinating to see um you know definitive uh not proof but a, a definitive way that was um uh, you know, established to communicate with spirits, for instance, that, uh, you know, that was widely accepted that we could absolutely confirm. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of interesting experimental things that occur now. We have a lot of people that feel fully confident that they have communicated with the spirit world. I, I do. I feel that way. Uh, but, you know, can you imagine the leap uh, that it would cause in oh gosh, you know, uh, our society in general, if suddenly there was an established way that we could dial in, you know, just like we can pull up the internet now, you know, what if there was a way to, <laughs> you know, to connect like that to the spirit world, that would be pretty mind boggling. Uh, you know, if we go to UFOs, of course, the, uh, uh, you know, the classical first contact where it's, you know, fully, accepted on a wide scale you know here we are but then we just don't know what we're getting do we? because they could be positive and they could be negative uh the creatures you know it's a bit more controversial i i know it's it's funny because so much attention has been put on sasquatch the last few years but i know people in the field who actively go out and research and, and look for this thing but at the same time they'll be one of the first ones to tell you that in some ways they hope that it's never accepted by science you know for you know at least for a very long time because as soon as that happens i mean you know how many scientific institutions are going to want a specimen quote uh you know and are going to be beating the bushes with paramilitary teams trying to hunt these things down right and uh you know we just we don't know enough to really know, you know, how many of them are there and so forth. So, well, let me let um, me rephrase this question then, because I understand your point. You care about these creatures. You want to make sure that even if they're never detected, that they at least have an opportunity sur to survive. So, for you, out of all the creatures you have seen or encountered, is there any that you haven't seen yet that you would love to see with your own eyes? Uh, the Loch Ness monster. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that comes to mind right off. Oh, you know, simply because that's one of the first things I remember as a kid. You know, hearing about in the 1970s. You know, we didn't hear about as wide a range of these different things because a lot of it was localized and regional and so forth. But on a national level, you know, what did we hear about? We heard about Bigfoot. Uh, and we heard about the Loch Ness Monster. You know, those were kind of the big two. So that would be pretty fascinating. And, th and then actually, you know, when you look at water monsters, they probably have the highest potential for being proven uh, in the next, you know, 10, 15 years or whatever, because we have seen some of them proven already. You know, we've had, of course, the famous coelacan, which was a long time ago, but, you know, the giant uh, squid. It was thought to be a myth for a very long time, and it's, you know, we now have definitive proof, you know, yeah, no, those exist. So I, I think we'll discover a lot more in the oceans for sure. Megalodon for me, man. I only need a picture because I ain't going to the ocean to find <laughs> yeah. it. David, I want to yeah. say thank yeah, you. Really? <laughs> yeah. I want to say thank you once again, my friend, for being not only a great friend of Spaced Out Radio, but a mentor and a, and a real leader in this field. For all of us, including myself, members of our audience, and everybody out there who's looking at the right way to do things, you are one of the best, my friend, and I thank you for participating on this show as much as you do. Hey, my pleasure, man. Good talking with you. Absolutely. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Space Out Radio continues.
Great show, Davey. Always a good time, man. I appreciate you, man. And uh, I'd, I'll get a hold of you soon to figure out what you want to do for December because I know I sent you that schedule. I'm just not sure uh, if you wanted to be on in December. Uh, yeah, I probably can, but let's, yeah, just shoot me an email or something. We'll figure it out. We'll look at the dates or whatever. All right, buddy. Have a great night. Have a great right, Halloween, man. All right. You too, bud. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You know, I don't know why, <clears throat> excuse me, but like, I, I, I'm so blessed that David Weatherly chooses to come on this show. And I don't know why, but every time he is on this show, I am so intimidated. So intimidated. Because he is just, you know, he's an icon in this field. And he's so smart. Like, I always feel, and and I don't mean this in an insulting way to myself, but I always feel so dumb around David. I do. I feel dumb around him. Because he is just so brilliant and and on the mark with everything that is going on. Like, nothing phases him. Nothing stuns him. Nothing is over-exaggerated. He, he never gets too high, never gets too low. And, you know, I mean, he's just the, the an amazing uh, mentor to all of us in this field. I am taking my boy trick-or-treating. For Halloween. And they are still allowing it here. And uh, off to work the St. Petersburg Grand Prix. Have a fun time there, Terrible Times. Mm Mm-hmm. If you see my buddy Gorbs, give him a Gorbs. I'd appreciate that. (coughs) Uh, Let's see here. Uh, yeah, and then I'm going to light off a bunch of fireworks. That's what I'm going to do. Seven boys trick-or-treating. Holy cow, you got a handful. You got your hands full for Halloween. Stay away from Kevin Moonlick's house. Apparently, he's giving away the bad candy this year. The candy nobody wants. He's gone to all the old folks' homes and collected that raw heart, uh, rock hard, stale, weird colored candy that every grandma and grandpa has. And he's given away to the children. And when Kevin is done giving away Grandma and Grandpa's rock-hard candy, he goes into his pantry and he hands out cans of sardines to the children. That's what kids get at Kevin's house, sardines. It's true. In Idaho, I thought they only give out potatoes, not candy for Halloween. (sighs) Excuse me. One minute. One minute. I know where Roy's going trick-or-treating. He's going to show up at Kevin's house. Hey, trick-or-treat, where's them sardine cans, Kevin? 
I can see it now. I can see it now. Hey, Spudgy Poo, how you doing? All right, guys, here we go. Nine seconds or something like that. Let's do this news thing. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I'm Dave Scott. Fantastic beard, great hair, and your host tonight. You all should be proud. Anyways, we're going to continue on here because we have a radio show to do. I want to remind you that if you missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a good time right now because speaking of the news, Shirky Poo's got us all set up. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire. At the back end of every show, we're getting to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the debunked. James Randi, a MacArthur Award-winning magician who turned his formidable savvy to investigating claims of spoon-bending, mind-reading, fortune-telling, ghost-whispering, water-dowsing, faith-healing, UFO-spotting, and a sundry of varieties of bamboozlement, bunko, chicanery, flim-flam, flummery, humbuggery, and more, has died. He was 92. His death was announced by the James Randi Educational Foundation. At once, Elfin and Mephistophelian, with a bushy white beard and piercing eyes, Mr. Randi, known as professionally the Amazing Randi, was a father of the modern skeptical movement. Much as the biologist and author Thomas Henry Huxley had done in the late 19th century, he made it his mission to bring the world of scientific rationalism to lay people. What roiled his blood and what the driving impetus was, Mr. Randy often said, was pseudoscience. It is all in its immoral irrationality. People who are stealing money from the public, cheating them and misinforming them, that's the kind of thing I've been fighting all my life, he said in his 2014 documentary, An Honest Liar, directed by Tyler Meesom and Justin Weinstein. Magicians are the most honest people in the world. They tell you they are going to fool you, and then they do it. Oh, yes. Mr. Randy began his career in the late 1940s as an illusionist and an escape artist. On one occasion, he extricated himself from a straitjacket while dangling upside down over the Niagara Falls. On another, after almost an hour from within a vast block of ice and on a third from still another straight jacket. This one suspended over Broadway where he hung as a New York Herald Tribune reported like a dead, like a dead tuna. I wanted to break records. Mr. Randy said in the film, invoking the master Houdini. I wanted to stay in a sealed metal coffin longer than he did get out of a straight jacket faster than he did under chains, out of leg irons, out of handcuffs. But in later years, Mr. Randy was not so much an illusionist as a disillusionist. Using a singular combination of reason, showmanship, constitutional cantankerousness, and a profound knowledge of the weapons in the modern magician's arsenal, he traveled the country exposing seers who did not see, healers who did not heal, and many others. Their methods, he said often, were available to any halfway adept student of conjuring and ought to have been transparent to early investigators who were sometimes taken in. He is dead at the age of 92. Starman, the dummy riding a cherry red Tesla Roadster through space, has made his closest approach ever to Mars. 
That electric convertible with its mannequin passenger bolted to the top of the Falcon Heavy rocket as a stunt during the SpaceX rocket's first test flight back on February 6, 2018. Man, that was two years ago already? I don't... Wow. Anyways, two years later, the Falcon Heavy upper stage of the vehicle at its tip are making the second trip around the sun. Jonathan McDowell, a Harvard astrophysicist who's tracking space objects as a side project, found that Starman has passed 4.6 million miles from Mars at 2.25 a.m. back on October 7th. That's about 19 times the distance from Earth to the moon and 35 times closer than anyone on Earth has ever gotten to Mars. The closest recent approach between to two planets was 34.8 million miles in 2003, according to World Atlas, though the planets are often hundreds of millions of miles apart. Now, no one can see Falcon Heavy's upper stage at this current distance. At least strange, beautiful images in once beamed home to Earth have long since ceased, but Orbits over periods of a few years are fairly straightforward to predict, and McDowell used data on how the rocket was moving when it left Earth's gravity behind to pinpoint its recent movements. The Roadster-bearing rocket stage is in on an asymmetrical orbit that really takes it as far as 1.66 times Earth distance from the Sun at one end of its track to about uh, 0.99 Earth's distance from the Sun when it gets back. Isn't that strange? I am not smart enough to be reading this story. Last time Starman circled the sun, McDowell said, it crossed Mars's orbit while the red planet was still quite far away, but this time the cross lined up with a fairly close approach, though still not close enough to feel a strong tug of Martian gravity. Well, good for Starman. Good for Starman. A visitor to New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art helped solve the mystery of a long-lost painting after recognizing a piece hanging in her neighbor's apartment. The museum said to a a visitor to the Jacob Lawrence of the American Struggle exhibition at the museum, noticed the artworks resembled a painting she had seen in her neighbor's apartment, and her curiosity was piqued further when she revealed that five of the 30 panels examining early U.S. history were missing. The woman spoke to her neighbors, an elderly couple who had purchased the painting at a friend's Christmas charity art auction in 1960. The couple spoke to museum officials and found out the Lawrence painting hanging in the Upper West Side Manhattan apartment of theirs was indeed one of the missing panels. The painting, panel 16 of the series, rejoined the rest of the series for the first time in decades when it was hung in the exhibition. The couple loaned the painting to the exhibition and gave permission for it to go on tour with the rest of the paintings when the exhibition at the Met ends November 1st. Last week, a friend of mine went to the show and said, there's a blank spot on the wall, and I believe that's where your painting belongs. I felt I owed it to both the artist and the Met to allow them to show the painting, the owner said. The painting's rediscovery was welcomed by museum director Max Holine. It is rare to make a discovery of this significance in modern art, and it is thrilling that a local visitor is responsible for that. Here's a cute story. Very cute story. Italian farmer Christian Malacci could not believe his eyes when one of his eight dogs gave birth to a bunch of puppies. But there was a weird puppy in there. One of them was green-furred. The tiny dog, immediately named Pistachio, was part of a five-dog litter born on October 9th all with white fur the same color as their mixed-breed mum, except him. Malachi runs a farm on the Mediterranean island of Sardinia with his brother-in-law, Gianangelo. It is rarely, extremely rare, for a dog to be born with green-colored fur. It is thought that it happens when pale-colored puppies have contact with their mother's womb with a green pigment called Beliverdin. Yeah, it's the same pigment that causes the green color in bruises. However, Pistachio's peculiar color won't last forever. The bright green his fur had on the day of his birth has faded day by day, and it will continue to do so until he gets older. While his brothers and sisters will be given away to new homes, Malochi will keep Pistachio on the farm and train him up to look after the sheep with his mother, Spalachia. Malachi said that during these tough times of the corona pandemic, Green is the symbol of hope and luck. 
So maybe it was meant to be that pistachio could put a smile on people's faces. Oh, that puppy's so cute. So cute. Created in 2005, a painting that transforms Monet's A Bridge Over Pond of Water Lilies into flying or fly-tipping spot uh, and uh, adding abandoned shopping trolleys and a traffic cone to the infamous garden scene. Who's done it? Well, of course, it's Banksy. Yes, his parody painting of a Claude Monet masterpiece has sold for 7.6 million pounds. It was expected to only get three and a half. Imagine that. This guy is so brilliant. Experts said it was one of the strongest, most iconic of the artist's works to go on sale. The painting is the second most expensive Banksy sold at auction after the reclusive artist devolved Parliament depicting the UK House of Commons populated by chimpanzees sold for £9.9 million last year. On that occasion, the 2009 work attracted a 13-minute battle between 10 different bidders. Sotheby says the hammer came down after five determined collectors battled for nearly nine minutes to drive the final price beyond its estimated three to five million pounds to become the second highest price for the artist at auction. Show Me the Monet was created as a part of a collection called The Crude Oils and has first been shown publicly only in Banksy's second gallery of ex- exhibition. Why can I not pronounce exhibition tonight? I don't know. The series also includes Vincent Van Gogh's sunflowers wilting uh, or dead in their vase, Edward Hopper's Nighthawks confronted by an angry man in Yukon Jack boxer shorts, and Andy Warhol's Marilyn Monroe refaced with Kate Moss. Alex Bransick, Sotheby's European head of contemporary art, said, In one of his most important paintings, Banksy has taken Monet's iconic depiction of the Japanese bridge in the Impressionist master's famous garden at Giverne, and transformed it into a modern-day fly-tipping spot. More canal than idyllic lily pond, Banksy litters Monet's composition with discarded shopping trolleys and a fluorescent orange traffic cone. How nice is that? How nice is that? Anyways, going on, more uh, ever prescient as a voice of protest and social dissent, here Banksy shines a light on society's disregard for the environment and favor of the wasteful excesses of consumerism. Monet's original 1899 oil on canvas was included in a series of 18 views of the footbridge in his garden, accumulating to the completion of 12 paintings. Good for Banksy. The founder of the French Impressionist painting bought a home near Giverne, Normandy, with a pond as he wanted to create something for the pleasure of the eye and also for motifs to paint. The artist's identity remains shrouded in mystery because nobody knows who Banksy is, but his work is now getting huge sums of money. Meanwhile, he continues to use his art in stunts that generate huge publicity. Beached on the western shores of the Caspian Sea, it looks like a colossal aquatic beast, a bizarre creation more at home in the deep than above waves. It certainly doesn't look like it's something that could ever fly, but it did fly, albeit a long time ago. After lying dormant for more than three decades, the Caspian Sea monster has been on the move again. One of the most eye-catching flying machines ever built, it's completing what could be its final journey. In July of 2021, or oh, pardon me, in July of this year, after 14 hours at sea, a flotilla of three tugs and two escort vessels maneuvered slowly along the shores of the Caspian Sea to deliver their bulky special cargo to its destination, a stretch of coast near Russia's southernmost point. It's here, next to the ancient city of Durban in Russia's Republic of Dagestan, that the 380-ton Lune-class Ekranoplan has found its new and most likely last definitive home. The last of its breed to sail the waters of the Caspian Loon was abandoned after the 1990s collapse of the Soviet Union, condemned to rust away at Kaspisk Naval Base, some 100 kilometers away. But before it could fade into oblivion, it had been rescued thanks to plans to make it a tourist attraction right at the time when its unusual travel concept could be poised to make a comeback. Ground effect vehicles, also known as ekranoplans, 
are a sort of hybrid between airplane and ship. They move over water without touching it. The International Maritime Organization classifies them as ships, but in fact they derive their uniquely high-speed capabilities from the fact that they skim the surface of the water at high speed between 1 and 5 meters. Anyways, they take advantage of an aerodynamic principle called ground effect. This combination of speed and stealth, their proximity to surface while the flying makes them difficult to detect on radar, got the attention of the Soviet military, which experimented with several variants during the Cold War. Well, this thing looks like a piece of junk, to be honest, but a cool piece of junk. It had like eight engines on it, a bunch of torpedo launching areas, and now it's just going to go sit there. A second loon, unarmed and assigned to rescue and supply missions, was at an advanced state of completion when, in the early 90s, the whole program was cancelled. After 30 years plus of inaction, getting the Sea Beast back on the move was no easy task, requiring the assistance of rubber pontoons and a carefully coordinated choreography involving several vessels. Well, that's nice. Now it'll just sit and dry dock for history. An Australian adventurer has become the youngest person to climb all seven summits, and the seven volcanic summits, as well as setting other world records. Daniel Bull likes to climb mountains. He has finished his quest to climb the seven summits, tallest mountain on each continent, and the seven volcanic summits, tallest volcano on each continent. Bull was dubbed the youngest person to complete the climb at the age of 37. A Utah Sheriff's Office shared a video of a wildlife officer being tackled by a deer after he did the deer a favor. He rescued it from a hammock. That's just no way to pay the deputy back. Kind of a violent hug. The Iron County Sheriff's Office said Deputy Dustin Roy and the Department of Wildlife Resources Officer Cody Jones responded to a resident's backyard to rescue a deer that had become entangled in a hammock. Yeah, the video shows a pair cutting through the hammock and freeing the deer, which then quickly charges at Jones and knocks him to the ground. Jones is able to grab a hold of the deer and wrestle it to the ground. I think it may have even included a suplex. The deer charges Jones a second time when he attempts to release it, but eventually backs up, stares down the two men, and takes off. It's all fun and games until the deer charges you, says the sheriff's office. The question is, what did they charge the deer with? Thought of the Dave happens every night at this time Where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages Then read your responses on the air Because we love the audience participation around here We really do Today's Thought of the Dave is as follows No politics! What do you find really scary at this time of year? Let's go to Marty. We always start off with Marty. Actually, this is not a scary time of the year for me. It's my favorite time of the year. My scariest time of the year is in April, when I have to file my taxes. That's always scary, too. Jules. Stories about people who hurt animals. Bossy Brook. Judging by the other answers, I've misinterpreted the question, but here's my answer anyway. Demonic Possession, a great movie based on true events dealing with the topics. The Exorcism of Emily Rose, far scarier than The Exorcist, in my opinion. Corey, horny Sasquatch is coming down from the mountains above. Oh, that is scary, Corey. But you're an attractive guy. They might be on to you. I, I may go look for Sasquatch with you. I'd be safe. Danny, Winter Depression. Kevin and Kevin's beard, two separate entities. Nothing. I love it. Davey. Happy birthday, Davey. I don't like it as the dark nights draw in and the hours of daylight are reduced. I need sunlight and lots, lots of it. Perhaps I'm part plant. Alex. Hungry bears, pre-torpor, and anti-Halloween Karens. Terrifying. Totally terrifying. Don. Nothing. Nothing at all. Kimberly. Nothing really scares me except, oh, icy sidewalks and snowy sidewalks. Not a fan. Rose. The weather, one minute it's lightning, the next minute it's snowing. Thanks, Iowa. Gabe. The referees. They are more powerful than any supernatural phenomena. They can make a whining team lose. 
or a winning team lose, now that's scary. June, I just love this time of year. I can't think of anything scary. Steven, I am prepped, and what scares me is that I'm going to have to use what I got when crap hits the fan, economy collapse, civil war, etc. Oh, you're one of them. He's a prepper. He's a prepper. All right, Lee, smarten us up a little bit here. Riding my motorcycle in icy weather. Yes, Major Lee, that is dangerous. Kira, oh, she's brave. Nothing. Just be on top of the wave, not under it. You know what's under the waves, Kira? Sharks. That's what's under the waves. That's scary. Catherine, this time of year is when my depression starts to move in and makes it home until about April. Buckle up. Here we go again. Oh, I know that feeling. Tim, dark, cold, dank, miserable weather at night. Hearing the wind blowing what's left of the leaves around. Branches crackling, swaying from no weight to make them balance. Jerry, my heating bills. Dale, winter is coming. You're in Texas, Dale. You have no idea what winter is. Jim Goodall, my ex. Nikki, every year there's a massive shift around the last week of October and it goes through the second week of February of the following year. Mm. Cold weather for Catherine. The roads and bad drivers for Ron. Matt, people driving around with a mask on. Oh, that bugs me. Linda, weather's uncertainty. Never know what to expect. Another Ron. More people in the woods. And probably the scariest one of all comes from Cynthia. Scary clowns on the street again. That drives me nuts when people do that. Totally drives me nuts. You want to drive me nuts? Fill my area with clowns. I will play bumper cars with you, by the way. I will. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Day. We'll do it on Facebook and Twitter again tomorrow. Thank you to Captain Shirk for a wonderful SOR Newswire, which can be found on our website, and to David Weatherly for coming in, talking monsters, weird stuff all night long. His website, once again, is erielights.com. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Thanks to everybody participating in our chat rooms on Spreaker, YouTube, LGAB, Rev Radio, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club at our website, and all the snarkers and starkettes hanging out at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. You were all awesome tonight. Give yourself a round of applause. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu Train docks for the night right about now. I don't like it, but I know you do. Don't either. Remember, your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. If you want to bring a friend for when we depart tomorrow, there's always room for them, too. Good night.